Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Listen in as we discuss all things business, growth and marketing with business owners, thought leaders and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, founder of Roundhouse, the creative agency, Saul Edmonds. Oh, hey everyone. Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast again. Today, I happen to be, by chance, talking to Chris Flagg. Chris, how are you today? Hey, good morning, Sol. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for the invitation and great to speak to you this morning. Yeah, likewise. Where, where are you Where are you uh, physically today in the world um, for uh, I, everyone listening? I'm in sunny Port Stephens uh, at the moment. And so overlooking sort of the beautiful bay of Port Stephens and it's, it's a lovely warm sunny day. I'm um, sorry for people say who are overseas, where's that in, in relation to? Like where's Port Stephens? So it's about two, hour, two and a half hours north of Sydney and about right. 45 minutes north of Newcastle. So it's a small little coastal town on a peninsula. Um, and so just over a year ago, we made the sea change after 20 years in Sydney, looking for something oh, yeah. uh, more of a quiet life with the kids, uh, have moved out to Port Stephens. And so enjoying that. And it's a lovely outdoors place to live. Nice part of the world, hey? Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. No, it's, it's a, it's actually one of the great things, I guess, isn't it? About. Um, you know, aspects as much as people might say certain things about the, the online world and our modern world. That's one of the, like the added benefits of being able to, um, do things, you know, via Zoom or online. Like it's always great to meet people in person too, but you can do like so many other things. That's like one of the great advantages. It still, it still kind of blows my mind, even though like it's, it probably sounds strange to some people that. I could even like talk to someone like you or talk to people then overseas and have these podcasts and people are uh, just anywhere. I think that's kind of amazing. Yeah, just that, that ability to connect to people that we wouldn't normally be able to chance to meet and face to face, you know, that physical boundary or the constraint of being in the same place at the same time. Um, obviously, you know, it was there before COVID and it's been accelerated since then. And yeah, it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity to, to take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So, so for people who don't actually know what we usually always do at the start, just to get sort of straight in, people so people get a um, a general idea of of who you are and what you do. Could you just give everyone a little bit of like an annotated sort of short history of generally what you do and what's the the first little taste of what we're going to be talking about today, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm the founder and director of Presentation Design Co. So we're a small award-winning team and we help make clients uh, deliver better presentations. Mm. So over the last 10 years, we've worked with local and international companies like uh, McDonald's, uh, Johnson Johnson and Toyota uh, to help them sort of cut through and make an impact when they present. Right. So ha- so as I, my first thing, which is probably from me being – a designer and like us doing sometimes presentations. I, I, I'm always really fascinated. It's, it's just a general sort of interest. I guess it's, it's because like when you have a little sample, we do like some of that stuff, but what was the catalyst? Like when you like, and, and I guess it'll be a little bit of a segue into your history about how you actually came to this point. Like what was the, what's, what's, what's your background and history that actually got you to at some point go, I'm going to have a company that's just about presentations. Like what was the catalyst like to actually do that, Chris? Absolutely. It was completely unintentional to, to, to get here. Uh, so my background was originally in banking financial services. Oh, really? So absolutely working in Sydney uh, oh. for Macquarie Bank and ANZ and presentations were a part of the role that we did uh, right. working out talking at conferences, going and talking, delivering workshops to advisors. It was just something that wasn't the core part of what we did, but it was just, it was part of the role. It was always something that I really wasn't that great at doing. You know, we all had that experience of, you know, growing up and, you know, going through school and you go through uni and you sort of yeah. pick up needing to do presentations along the way. Then you end up in a professional role and you end up doing more presentations. And so it was something that I wasn't particularly great at. I was probably hopelessly average at doing but was really keen to do well. 
along the path of working in financial services, met some great presenters and was always sort of felt inspired by the difference they made because the thing about presenting is most presenters are, you know, we've got the dual thing of being an audience member as well. We've seen lots of presentations. So when we go to present, we can see it from both perspectives. So I saw the difference that most presentations didn't really make an impact, but there were these scattered few that really fantastic that did. So along the path of working to try and get better, um, I sort of took some courses, had a light bulb moment at a conference in the Gold Coast where I'd failed miserably and sort of had the, made the decision, all right, that's it. It's time to approach this more seriously. There's nothing worse than that sinking feeling at sort of 2.30 in the afternoon when you feel that you've lost everyone on slide 11 and you've still got 20, 30 more slides to go. Oh, man, that's terrible. Yeah, but but it's it's so true, isn't it? Like it's, it's a it's – a, um, I think it's probably a pretty – special person who's just like one day they do the first presentation and they go, wow, I was born to do this. That's like, that's, that's like virtually nobody, I guess, isn't it? There's probably people who are, are, are naturally better at it or probably more predisposed to it. But like in, in, in your experience, like you had that, you had that moment and then um, is it, is it true to say that before and then after that, like you would have seen, you've done like, how many presentations have you done roughly, like overall, or um, four people and and on your own presentations? What do you reckon? Thousands over. Thousands, yeah. The so past sort of twenty five years. Yeah, so you've got like a vast, a vast like storehouse of information and reflection, and you've seen, um, you know, a lot of different types of presenting too, right? About how people how people present, but like um, you've got this thing called the presentation playbook, haven't you? I have. You got it. And, yeah, I know it's probably a little bit early to get into this in the conversation, but um, so that's that's a um, – what's the best way of of describing what that is for people? It's obviously a, a playbook, but what was the – at what point – during this particular journey, did you go, okay, I've been doing all these presentations for people. I'm going to do this. What was the primary reason for um, for writing that, for laying that out? Like you decided you had like enough knowledge to do it, or it was it was time to do it. Like what was the um, the penny that dropped? I guess. I so, said, well, look, it, it comes back to leaving banking and financial services. So I left right. to pitch a startup. And so working with a big company, you know, you're equipped with slides. You can always blame the marketing team. You've got a brand to stand behind. You've got people to help you with that. When it came to pitching for a startup, it was just myself uh, and someone else that I was working with. Um, so it was really the stakes were, you know, obscenely high compared to going to a conference and doing average. When you're out there to present your own idea and, and yeah. pitch for it, really, it's it's a real moment of truth. And so when it started in that process, this is back in 2011, I wanted to try and do something different. And that was the early days of Prezi. So it was, I remember catching a bus home back at BRW. It said, if you're tired of PowerPoint, which I was, and most of us are, try Prezi. So I was thinking around with Prezi uh, and using that for the pitch. And what was happening is that people had no interest in the pitch, sorry, in the, the, the idea that we're presenting, but they were fascinated by what Prezi was. If you haven't, seen Prezi or have you come across Prezi? Oh, yeah, journey? yeah, I've used Prezi a lot, yeah. yeah. So just the idea that, A, it was different to PowerPoint, B, it started to move around, it was dynamic, it had this big mm. canvas, and you could move in and move out of things. And so I, whilst I was busy trying to work on the startup idea, uh, people uh, that I knew from sort of, you know, my professional network were asking for help, saying, hey, we've got something coming up. I've been, I was an advocate for Prezi, and they asked me to come along and help with their presentation. Completely unqualified to do so. You know, it was an early stage of Prezi as well. Um, but it started that process. I, you know, on the side, I didn't have a, a, an income at the, at the time because I was working on the idea. And so I was getting called out to help people with their presentations. Very early in the stage, I had a friend that was working for a not-for-profit in Sydney and he called in to help with the, one of their big industry events. Um, I just worked with the CEO, designed the Prezi for that. That was picked up by Prezi.com and featured on their homepage. And oh, right. the marketing company that was covering the event said, what the heck was that? You know, <laughs> would you come, if, if we paid you, would you come and train us how to use it? And at the time I went, that's, that's a fantastic funny. idea. You, you, 
uh, of sort of getting that opportunity. And that was over 10 years ago. And that was the start of the process. So initially it was the case of creating Prezi's and then teaching people how to use Prezi. It was a different process in putting something together. I found Prezi just worked for my brain better. And that's what sort of made something more mm. effective. And, and that essentially grew over that time. So uh, worked in a relationship with Prezi, uh, became a Prezi expert. And that was the, sort of the genesis of Presentation Design Co. So that was essentially training people with workshops how to use Prezi. And that's ultimately how to think Prezi and then how to use, use it as a tool. Uh, mm. And then the design side as well, too, where people said, look, I've got something coming up. Um, we'd like to get some assistance in creating a Prezi. And so we'd have a team that would work with them to develop that. Yeah. So have you got, uh, like, as as far as, because um, my first assumption is it's probably just because I'm a designer. I, I thought, well, I wonder, because I, I, I sort of read through um, your website and, and some information about you doing my, you know, pre-research for the podcast. And I was like, yep. I wonder I wonder if Chris has has got a design background if that's where it came from that sort of stuff so have you is is that a part of what you did or you just more gravitated to um like the presentation side of it and what those tools could actually do to enhance the actual person's presentation which which way did it actually come from like for your uh i guess um initial you know, the gluing of those two things together like that, you know, you're going, this is a great tool. I've had, you know, this this urge to help other people to do this because I've gone, you know, through, I'm like you were saying before, your own own story, which is always a great, that seems to be like a common catalyst for things is people going, you have to do something really important. You have to do it yourself. You learn Absolutely. a bunch of amazing lessons on the way. And even though it's often like super stressful. So what angle did you, is, is there a design background there as well or, or just not at all? No, not at all. Um, initially that was a stage. So the thing that drew me to, to Prezi and teaching people, if you were to approach Prezi in the same way that we've been taught to think about PowerPoint for a while in that linear basis of just one thing after another, mm. uh, you can do that in PowerPoint, you can get away with it and it can still look neat and tidy. It hides the thinking behind it. But with Prezi, you really need to break down a structure and a flow first to put it into Prezi. And that was a bit that I was really good at doing. So working with clients to try and sort of draw out and structure the message and the flow. And sometimes that could take an hour. You know, I think the record was two and a half days at a whiteboard working with clients. And that was really the experience of deep diving with people about the structure and flow of presentations. Um, so we had a team, and that was the, the start of the team of getting graphic designers. So we'd have, get some help with the artwork to put that yeah. within the Prezi. But that was that really case of, and that was probably a, a learning point, is that most people haven't been forced to think about that degree when they present. They kind of think, I'll put a title slide in, I'll put some content. Um, but, the, you know, PowerPoint doesn't um, give you a hard time for not structuring your presentation. Where in mm. Prezi, if you did that in, it would be a spitting mess all over the screen and make people seasick. So it's a real true. consequence of doing it. And that was true, the part true. that people were looking to do. So they were looking to be able yeah. to go, I want to use Prezi. But it was really that first stage of really breaking down the structure and flow, generating ideas and putting things together offline before we put it online that created the real magic. And so that together in Prezi was something that was really awesome. Um, but that first stage was the bit that I was really good at doing. Is is there a part of of that thinking um, in relation to Prezi? Because uh, my experience in using Prezi, which how I had always used it, the thing that that sort of jumped at me first was that you could have you could, if 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 you had a a um, core idea or ideas, you could represent that in sort of like one large overriding visual, and then zoom in on all the, all the parts of it. That was the thing that jumped out at me first that was really different to going from slide to slide because you could never really do that and make sense of it. Um, and I, like in very early days too, when it was more, because um, it's obviously changed, like some of those those tools of how you do that has has changed a little bit, but it was sort of that really zooming in then zooming out and panning around. That was the thing that as, because um, I do a lot of, you know, things like um, – motion design too so mm. i was like that's fantastic that that can be interactive and so when when uh because when you were talking about like the, that that um important um level of you know bringing 
everything together and having is, is that part of Prezi was that a um a part of what drew you to it as well like in in that sort of way that like overarching thing you could see this big picture like either at the end of it and like have the big reveal at the end or um could you speak to that a little bit like about how yeah. you were thinking Absolutely. So we remember sort of context over content. The brain that works, we have this sort of spatial awareness. And the example I often gave was like Google Maps. You know, the idea is that we'd like to know where something is. Our reference point is to first look at the, the country, the state, the city, the suburb and the street. We have, that's naturally how we sort of think and process and recall. So that's the non nature of Prezi, which is great. Like, you know, here today, I'm going to talk about three things. So here's an overview of those three things. Let's go and explore the first one in detail by going into that. And at the end of that point, we come back out to the overview. So there's a reminder. So there's repetition of that as well. And we go to the second one, come back out, and third one, come back out as well. Mm. Really nice and simple, but it just suited uh, the way that I thought. And it also suits the way that people receive information presentations. The linear nature of sort of slides is very much like lots of pages in the book. You know, we don't have chapters and we, you know, it, with, with headings and the like, and we keep moving the pages between each other. It doesn't really make sense, even though it looks neatly formatted. But with Prezi, that sort of that, that strict structure that was in place gives us a way or a platform and architecture to be able to present information in a much more contextual way. And so that's the structure and flow that comes out from using Prezi. Now, you don't have to use it. A lot of people created what we call Prezi Point, which is basically PowerPoint and, PowerPoint and Prezi, and that was the stuff that made people sick and kind of spin around. Um, but the way that you sort of broke it down in the information, it was just a more effective way. And there were some great revelations working with clients once they saw that things. Most presentations break down for one main idea with three to five groups of content. Most of them, I'd say 90% of them plus. Um, and forcing people to go through that discipline of breaking down that in terms of what they were talking to really helped in how they were going to explain something. And also when they came to present on the day, they had this natural structure behind what they were talking to. And it was amazing to see the difference it would make. It was that, and plus the wow factor, it moved, right? There were some cool things into it that were yeah. very different. Again, it's not, wasn't a standard PowerPoint. There were some things in there from the design side that were pretty cool. Yeah, so you're putting all those things. Like a video, you can, it, and, and there's other media you can have in it. And, you know, there's a lot of other things you can do. I mean, you could also do that in uh, PowerPoint, obviously, too, but the context is different. It just makes it that little bit more exciting, too, I guess, doesn't it? Absolutely. And so we were doing that for, for, for TED Talks. Uh, we worked with Rebecca Huntley in 2013, uh, Nadine Champion in 2015 for her TED Talk. We've done just you know, $500 million pitches, uh, you know, and sort of worked in sort of really high stakes presentations for, mm-hmm. you know, small and large companies. When it came that to the fact that they really needed to win a presentation, they really needed to have an impact. They were like, well, let's try something different. They'd try Prezi and we'd be working with clients. And that was the start of the, the, the relationship we had with clients and working presentations. Over time, sort of Prezi slipped away from the technical side of things. It became sort of less Prezi-like and sort of a little bit more um, PM easy to use, but lost some of its Prezi magic. And at the same time, within PowerPoint, which is sort of, you know, the corporate workhorse, PowerPoint took in some of the features that made Prezi great. Yeah. So it went from that case, again, after spending years and years of working within Prezi exclusively, we went, to, you know, we had a great relationship with Prezi. We won the Prezi Awards for design. Um, we're strong advocates for Prezi. And we've taught thousands and thousands of people how to use Prezi over time. Um, but clients would say, look, hey, I've got, you know, we work together once in a year on a, on a major conference or something similar, but I've got this PowerPoint next Tuesday that I need and I'm out of time. Can you just make it look a little bit better? Yeah. So... Begrudgingly, we started to sort of pick up, you know, to helping clients to, to work in sort of back into PowerPoint. And as the, some of the structural changes in PowerPoint, uh, came into play. So things like section zoom and the like, we found that we could then take what we did in Prezi, but the thinking that we did and replicate and PowerPoint to create things that people could then edit themselves. They didn't need a license for and they could use on a regular basis. So there wasn't a training or an investment in learning Prezi. Right. So they could still get the same result, but still do it in PowerPoint. Now, most people don't use PowerPoint that way. It's still sort of linear, click, click, sort of move through slide by slide. Uh, but that was that transformation away. So probably 90% of what we do at the moment uh, is in PowerPoint and 10% still in Prezi. Um, but it's still the same thing. It's still years and years of the process that we use within Prezi to be able to make PowerPoints that really make an impact. Uh, you'll probably cover um, uh, perhaps um, some of these when you, you, uh, you'll be speaking sort of Soon in the podcast about um, the five power principles, which you were um, sort of mentioning um, as, as a core part of what you um, sort of speak about when it comes to presentations. But 
on on just one point too, one thing that that I've always found, say whenever um like our our task is often as as designers, it's not quite um like we might offer advice, but we don't have that same sort of role that you do when you're advising from the ground up, like somebody already has their you know exactly what they want to do and they just want us to I mean to implement it. And that's fine. But one of the things that I that always or well, not always, but most of the time jumps out is that people have too much information and like the amount of information versus what they're going to be saying and also the time in which they have to say it often don't match up. And I, you know, I just know from doing like, you know, lots of presentations, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert, but you know, you never have enough time and you always go and you always go over, over time. Um, unless those, uh, I've, well, this is maybe a theory, but this is just my observation is that the, some of the disconnect and the problems that happen with people going, Oh my gosh, I've only got five minutes left or I've got two minutes left and I haven't even covered like a third of what is on the slides yep. <laughs> is the, that's, that's the problem is that the, there's a disconnect between them going, okay, I'm going to be saying X, but Y being the visuals and the content that's on on the slides, one, you can never read anything as on the slides. Two, it always appears to me like uh, one of those two things is going to take the attention because people can't sort of like be reading huge amounts of content, especially if it's really small, and then listening at the same time. So can I get your 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 thoughts on that because it's either you know is um less is more is is obviously like often often true but you know your thoughts on on having done this for a long 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 time about that that content versus what people are saying think yeah absolutely there's a couple of things in there to unpack there Saul um when it comes to to, to the length I'll I'll cover that in in the principles because I think there's sure. there's a part there. The, the shotgun approach of, of let me tell you lots of things that that's, you know, it, it starts at the beginning and starts to go array when we use that shotgun, let me cover everything, but let's get to, to text and bullet points. So it's one of the things that the clients hate the most or, you know, audience members as well too. The idea that if we think about it, the slides are being used really as a talking aid. So they're a prompt for the presenter to talk through rather than mm. visual aid. The way that we see the world is you're the primary visual aid. So when you go to present, it's up to you to create the connection. Uh, it's up to you to be that primary visual aid in your presentation. So if we think about it, even though they're pretty big sometimes in the background, the slides are the visual aid. So we start off this idea, do you need anything at all? You know, some of the best presentations can be conversations where people can talk to. And there is a big thing saying, you know, get rid of PowerPoint, don't use it. And there's a case for that at times. But when it comes to presenting, you might want to present, uh, you might need things to talk to as prompts. Um, you might want to present charts and diagrams. You know, there is a, a case for having a visual aid to talk to. The biggest challenge is that we can't read and listen at the same time. So every time something comes up onto the screen, mm. uh, your brain is triggered to read it and it shuts off the listening to the presenter part. So that's the part that, that causes the biggest problem, that frustration of when something comes up onto a slide, your brain will automatically read that and you'll hear that voice in your head at the same time someone's presenting and talking. So you've got this contest going on in your head and it can be really frustrating. A, and secondly, the fact it's really boring when someone just reads off something that you've already just read yourself. It's like, okay, we're doing this twice now. Yeah. There's a there's a neuros neuroscientist in Melbourne, Dr. Jared Cooney Horvath, and so he did some work around how the brain works to try and get to the bottom of why that is and where the magic number is because no more than this, there's so many misstated rules out there. Where it came down to is seven. So we can process and read seven words at the same time without creating that competition with what's uh, between the speaker and what we can see on the slide. So the idea for that is to go, well, okay, seven's kind of the magic number, keeping things to really simple keywords and icons. So rather than writing full sentences, just abbreviated sentences that give you a prompt to talk to, but don't give out the whole sentence. Mm. That's a way that you can, even with heavy presentations, that you can be able to take things to make them easy to process and digest and still use it as a visual aid effectively. Mm. Yeah, I, I, that's actually, it's interesting because hearing you say that it's um a, a lot of the same sort of content conversation that I have with people about infographics because um, infographics are because um, we do a, a a lot of that sort of work and 
probably just about every infographic or at least every second infographic, uh, people have a vast amount of content because they go, infographics are great for data visualization. Yes, they yeah. are, but people still have to absorb it. And then it's like, what, like, who's going to be looking at it? Where are they going to be looking at it? What size are they going to be looking at it at? I mean, there's a whole, whole range of like then other um, different sort of aspects with a infographic and its purpose as a visual tool, but like it, mm. then it comes back to the context in which you're, um, cause even though like I, I love design, love making things look great and move and look cool and, and all that, that's, you know, I, that's a, a, that's a really fun part of what I do, but it can't like in, in my mind, it, it shouldn't, if it's going to have a, a some sort of adverse effect on the, the other part of it in, in this case, if, if someone's presenting, if it's, if it's drawing something away and yep. it's not complementing or it's, if it's being distracting, then it's no good. You know, it's, it's got to be, it has to be removed or it's got to be toned down or, you know, any, any, any number of things. But I guess like this is good. I'm um, sort of segue to for you to, um, if you can sort of take us through a little bit of the, um, the five, power principles that you talk about and and so where are they the five power principles are in the playbook is that right yeah absolutely yeah um so tell us about um run through some of those and why and how you actually came to uh, you know from experience i guess you know if you're going okay now you're at a good place to hone these back into these like four principles for people to um to latch onto right like as as um things that they need to consider back in the the, the days of looking to, working in financial services services looking to get better presentations there was plenty of methodologies and frameworks and ideas out there there were quite a few of them contradictory quite a few of them were complex and when putting to the test i didn't feel that they would work that well for me in the process of you know the early days of working with Prezi and working with clients, you know it was really getting deep into structure and flow. And we, you know, over the past ten years, we've seen almost every type of presentation for every type of presenter. And I've always been obsessed and sort of really intensely curious about what works. A really pragmatic approach. And I haven't seen any of those stack up over the long term. People have their own experience. You know, they know their clients, they know their customers, they know what they're talking to, and. The hard thing about a complex methodology is follow this approach or the like. It doesn't always give people the opportunity to be themselves within that. So mm. what we're looking to do, what I was looking to do, and it was intentional to begin with, is try and find what are the common denominators at work, what is actually effective. And we had so many chances to be able to test and measure what was working for clients, You know, what really unlocked them on the path of becoming a better presenter and having more of an impact. Over the years, it really just still distilled down to five things. And that's the, where the power principles came back from. And for people that are new to presenting, it, it's a bit of a North Star to go to and say, okay, if you are there, take you, take your authenticity, take your experience. And these are the five things to follow. For experienced presenters, we, we've been running some workshops recently with people who have been, you know, presenting for government for 15 to 20 years. They had their experience. They've done this many, many times. For them, the power principles are more of a refresh, a bit of a reset to go, okay, this is just a reminder before I start the task and as I travel through it, I need to make sure these are my foundations that I've got in place if I'm really looking to make an impact. Because on your way, a lot of people present as part of their role, not on a full-time basis, but on a part-time basis. It's something they do over time. Some people present two times a year. Some people present 20 times a year. They don't always have the chance to practice that much. So when it comes to doing it, they can do the same thing and they probably don't experiment as much as they should. Mm. So what we wanted to do in the principles is really distill down what we learned over time in a way that was really easy to digest and give people a framework to follow. And that's the five power principles. The hard truth is that most presentations fail in that sense. If we think about presentations are about change. We're looking to change how someone thinks, you know, change their behavior or change what they do. The communication and presentation is, is that moment of truth to allow that to happen. You've got this moment, you've got the audience's attention, and it's a chance then to make that change happen. Mm. And the failure that takes place isn't really, you know, most of the time isn't people throwing rocks at a presenter and a massive failure. It's just that, that failure to make an impact and make that change happen to the degree that you'd like. Yeah. And, and, and you never like is, um, what's your experience with, with people actually? finding out even like just on on the subject of people who've 
for being presented. I mean, sometimes it might be apparent to them. They just get like a strong feeling that maybe it's not going how it should have gone. But how how often do you reckon, um, I know there's probably no real solid sort of numbers around this, but how often do you reckon people actually know like really how successful or not successful it was? Like there's a lot of, a lot of like, you know, assumptions there, I guess, isn't there? Like around, it was it, you know, or they just had a bad feeling, but it was actually okay. Like it actually went fine. <laughs> and they were just, and they're just like, you know, like, like, oh, it went terrible. You know, people were, you know, more highly critical. What do you think? Do you feel that, um, like, is, is, is that, um, is there a level of correlation between that and how experienced the person is? They get, they've had more experience, so therefore they have a better sense. It would be great if there was a big green and red light button at the end of the buzzer at their end of the presentation. Yeah, it, would, it would be. It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? And that's one of the infuriating things. So presentations can be such a, a nerve-inducing act for people, yeah. and most of the times you don't find out. Very few instances it might be, you know, if you are pitching, you might get a yes or no response from there. But even then, it, it's hard to know, was that the presentation successful or not? It's part of such a process, right? Um, if it's a conference or a workshop, you really don't know. You have evaluation forms, but that's not just solely based on your presentation instead. So the hard thing is the feedback mechanism isn't that great. We don't get this kind of really clear delineation of was I successful or not? And so we kind of exist in this world of how do you feel about it? Oh, it kind of went okay or it didn't go okay. And sometimes yep. people uh, are so nervous that they're happy with, I'm just happy that it's over. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's over. Next, please. Yeah, they got to, but like, so um, from say your perspective as so, um, so not other people, but um, for you as a presenter, have have you have you had like that same sort of experience? Has it been like largely you have really no idea, or you or you actually have like as you've been doing this more for other people, have you found that like the process of teaching and analyzing and doing for other people has helped you uh, be a little bit more in tune with you know that unknown? Like has that helped you at all? Absolutely, developing that intuition over time, and yeah. I think the key it's measure like a for that gut feeling is it is it is it a gut feeling, or is, or is it like somewhere between? It's like where gut feeling meets intellect, and going. It's obviously based on because, like with a lot of things, like there's I I I try to listen to my gut, um, whatever that means. But it obviously everyone knows what it means, even if you can't. Mm. I don't, even if you can't put it into words, everyone knows what it means. You just go. No, nah, it's not right. Or, but, but it's where that meets the intellect. But there's still, to some extent, um, a better judgment on what we're talking about. Is it, is it like right from your perspective as a presenter to say that that's been better informed by, you know, more experience with other people? You know, like say me being, you know, hypothetically, which I I think might be true, me being better at asking questions because I do more podcasts, you know, which I think I am. Like, I think I'm better, even though I've never reflected on it, but I was like, I think I am. I think I am better. Not, I don't ask like, you know, I just have more practice. You know, it's like you do things more, right? Absolutely. I think the two key things to, to, so it is intuition over time, but the two key things that you're looking for are engagement. And that's something that you can feel on the time. Is everyone with me? Or, you know, again, you're never going to have everyone with you. 10% of the room isn't going to turn up on that day. They may just have had a bad week or an email before you've gone in to present. But do I feel people with me? And that's that level of engagement. And I think that's half of the success. And the other part is the interaction. So, and that might be during the presentation or after the presentation, sure. you know, was this the catalyst for, you know, that interaction to take place? So engagement and sort of interaction, I think, are the two measures of success um, in a in a broader scope. You know, NPS or audience feedback is a, sort of a more of a specific measure. Um, but on the time during the presentation, I think they're the two key things to look out for that you can tell if you're being successful and having an impact or not. Sure. And so what about some of the other power principles? I'm to run through some of them. Absolutely. Well, there's five of them. and 
they're pretty simple, right? And so often when I go through those, none of these are going to be uh, absolutely sort of revelatory in that sense. Yeah. But the first thing is the audience is number one. And yeah. that's number one because I think that's where the first mistake takes place. Putting together a presentation is often a solo process. You know, you might talk to other people yeah. in the way. You might be able to go out there and, and have a bit of a poll or talk to the audience beforehand and do some research. But most of the time you're doing it by yourself. And then there's a great lead up to the actual act itself, that moment of truth. Yep. And all through that, it's a pretty internal process. How am I going to do this? What am I going to talk about? What do I need to tell people? So we go through this essentially as a solo process, but then go out and have a presentation. It loses its way pretty quickly unless the mindset is, how am I here to serve my audience? So the term that we use is humble servant. So until you've identified how it is that you're going to create a fair exchange with the audience, how are you going to create value for them? And what are you, what problems are you solving for them? How can you solve them better for us? Unless we've identified what you're doing for them, you've already kind of lost the course. No matter of design or the like is going to make a difference kind of from there on. So that's number one. The audience is number one. Mm. Uh, number two is the idea of starting with the end in mind. And coming back to your earlier point about presentations running over length. Well, the idea is that most presentations, almost all, should have just a single objective. And that's defined. So the idea is that we're starting with the audience in mind and we're just doing a single objective for what that presentation. So what should the world look like after that presentation takes place? What would you like that change to occur? Really kind of honing into that. And again, this isn't PowerPoint. This isn't, you know, sort of a technical thing, but it's really that deep thinking. What would I like to happen as a result of the presentation? If I didn't give this presentation, what would happen? And that's that change in the future that you'd like to take place. And that's where you can start to draw some inspiration. And it's where the energy when you come to deliver can also start as well too, is what would I like to take place? The third one is this idea of being authentically you. Tony Robbins works for Tony Robbins. Often when we think about high impact presenters, it's woohoos and running onto the stage and all these, you know, the, 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 the high energy from there. And that's a kind of the stereotype when people are looking to be able to get better at presentations and I've seen some fantastically charismatic people carry that energy onto the stage and not be very good at the actual presentation part. The authenticity. So the idea is that, again, nerves come uh, just hand in hand with giving a presentation. We are going to be judged. People are going to look at us. They are going to make a decision if they like you or not. That's just going to take place anyway. Yep. But this idea of just being comfortable, being brave and courageous to say and connect with that authentic version of yourself. So when you turn up, the idea is that when we look to sell to people, or talk to people, and we're not that authentic version of ourselves, people can feel that. It doesn't create a sense of engagement, right? But when people connect with what you're saying in an authentic way and connect with you as a presenter, you've got an enormous chance to have that level of engagement and impact. Mm. Uh, the fourth one is uh, assume no one cares, assume apathy. So the fourth power principle is it's no one cares about what you're going to present to. <laughs> which which that's, is a healthy that's, that's sad chris that's terrible <laughs> that's that's terribly sad but true oh it's well, a great starting well, point well yeah well it's it everything's like um everything's great from there really isn't it you know everything has to be good after that it's a great ego check to walk through because <laughs> we, we, we work in what we do and we connect with an audience and we just assume people are going to be interested or can understand what we're talking to <laughs> sure. but it's up up to you to make it interesting, to give credibility, yeah. to give passion, and really sort of, you know, to, to give uh, a, a real um, reason for people to care what you're talking to. Mm, yeah. And and the uh, – was that the fourth one? Yes. What's the last one? Uh, always over-deliver. <laughs> Prepare to over-deliver. And this it, it, there is a technical component of that, right? Obviously, make sure everything works technically. But what we suggest the idea is that imagine that you've got an X and Y axis. Maybe this comes from working financial services. Things look great as charts. Yeah. But if you've got a 20 minutes or 35 minutes or 45 minutes, like draw that out and think about the energy that you're going to have over that time. You know, if it's a case that you're going to sort of start with a high level of energy and what you're talking through to have these moments of that, that sort of 30 to 45 minutes that really map out that journey as you take place over the presentation. Most presentations start at 45 minutes and if we're drawing graph, it kind of just draws down at the end as the energy slowly saps from, saps from the room at slide number 42. And as we kind of guide our way towards a couple of minutes to finish and there might be sort of lunch afterwards, it kind of picks up at the end. But there's generally a, an overload of information and that draws down that engagement over time of being people being talked to, picks up a little bit at the end. Okay, so we take that as going, well, that's the natural 45 minutes. So how can you design that flow over the 45 or the time you've got allocated 
to be able to create a modulation in the presentation over that time. So how did you, um, when uh, when there was the big, um, uh, the great sort of influx of people coming more online when COVID sort of hit and everyone was all of a sudden doing everything online, how did that actually, uh, well, uh, I, I was going to say, how did it have an effect on what you're doing? But I actually changed the question, like how did it, uh, what lessons did you end up learning, if any, about like say presentations that may have otherwise been in the real world in front of a real group of people? Did you like learn any um, like really valuable lessons that have carried over now into like everything that you do with going, okay, so we would usually have the advantage of being able to do this in front of people. Has is are there any really significant differences and then things that you learned from all that stuff where people were like, oh, now, you know, or, or they're overcoming the um, the idea that it's not going to be as good because it's just online now? Good point. You know, it, online presentations were always sort of like the poor cousin of the face-to-face presentation. Yeah, that's right before COVID. Um, I, I think early on, it was that idea of this job is going to be infinitely harder for people to present to. The idea is that when you're in a room and you're presenting live, you know, it, it can be more nervous. The idea is that you are physically there and the like, but the benefit being is that you can connect with your audience, you can measure their engagement, you can feel the room and how that's happening. And you've got a greater sort of like a, a greater toolkit of techniques to engage your audience. The idea of being able to do that, and you've got a feedback loop of, of how you're going along the way. Not having a feedback loop for presentation when you're not too sure it's being successful or not, and you're not too sure who's paying attention uh, or not, it's incredibly unknown. difficult. The great unknown. And also, I guess, the mutual understanding that at any point in time, a person listening, like in the audience who's just on another screen, and yeah. if they like have to go to the toilet or the dog's outside, they can just they can just disappear. I mean, that's a, that's like, and everyone knows that and everyone's like, yes, that's fine. That's like how it works, but it's still like, it must have some impact. I imagine like um, mentally on people presenting um, is, is, uh, you know, I mean, it might be subtle, but it's still there, right? Because of what you're saying with the feedback loop. Absolutely. We, we call it when presenting, it's like winning the war for attention. So the idea when you yep. present in a live environment, you know, it, it, it's people can subconscious sort of consciously check out. You might lose people, but they're still physically with you. Yeah. Online, when you are presenting online, you're in a competition with so many other sort of variables at play. And that can be really hard, right, to yeah. then know, have I really sort of captured everyone's attention? And it's going to make your job harder to do that. So the thing that we learned, come back to the city question, was it's a skill. You know, it is a skill. It's not just the same thing. And it's going to be harder to master than a, than a live environment as well. And we've seen some people transform from who maybe weren't fantastic in a live environment to be really good online presenters. Um, it suited some people better, but the task at whole is, is infinitely more challenging. So that affected the way that we design presentations from the visual side as well, generally keeping things shorter for the length of it. And yep. when we think about that in the, uh, the idea of creating the chart, it becomes more important to be able to map out what that journey looks like. So if it's 45 minutes face to face or 25 minutes sort of online, it's really important to have more levels or more techniques of engagement um, in an online environment to be able to kind of have those moments, spark moments along the way. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I guess, is it true then to say like, um, uh, because people have certain expectations about, you know, online and that freedom that they have to do X or, or Y, that there might be something, um, yeah, I, I don't know, more interactive at the end of the presentation that they can click on or they can interact with because that's what they're used to doing already, right? Like, so, um, so they continue that, that sort of habit and you, um, go with the flow about what their, their habits are anyway. Um, is, is, um, is that something that you've sort of, had to consider that then is a, a potential advantage of of doing a presentation online. Um, that's not not quite the same in in person. That somebody can then you know, respond digitally, like on the spot, as opposed to having to go, 
okay, I'm um, like, scan this QR code on my banner or like, you know, here's a flyer, scan this, or we're going to send an SMS to everybody in the room or <laughs> things that are, you know, probably an extra step away from going press or find out more or some call to action of, of some sort. Is, is that true? Or, or yeah. is that like as, as a, 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 a part of things that may have emerged a bit more, you know, through that like sudden, um, you know, greater influx on online, you know, over the past few years because people sort of were at, at home more? Makes me think of two things um, from, from from what you've mentioned. One is that in that, that that another thing we learned from the shift to online is that that beautiful idea is that you know questions are the, the awful hollow point sometimes. You know, at, you know, the thank you question slide at the end. Has anyone got a question? No, hands down. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> or the burning question that people have that might be introverts that that don't feel comfortable asking that during a presentation. In a group, in a big group. Absolutely. And that's what we've seen really sort of great uh, effective mm. online presenters do is to be able to unlock that, to go, no, I, this can be more of a conversational type approach. So regular stopping to ask questions and having that time dedicated to chunk things up in that way and giving an opportunity for people to ask questions or say something different or look to clarify things that wasn't there before. That's an interesting point. Yeah. that's And, and, and to go with the, um, I guess what I touched on before about, you know, the people's habits are already there. You know, they're yep. used to flitting around. They're used to going, oh, I'm watching YouTube. I'll do a bit of work. I'll click on this. Or, oh, I'll look at some online shopping. And there's like, you know, things that are drawing their attention that they're very happily doing. So like mm-hmm. to continue, I guess, that, that type of, of habit by using the medium. I guess it's, it's in, in a way, it's, um, it's, uh, another example of using the medium then in the online context in a good way, in the same way that you might use the medium of a Prezi presentation or a PowerPoint presentation in a room is that you're not, you know, you're not, um, you know, I'm sure like many of those same rules apply, you know, not having content competing with uh, people listening to the presenter, but, Mm. you know, some of those same rules obviously apply, but, Different context. It's like, um, you know, it's, it's sort of strikingly similar. Um, I find like listening to you talking about all this, like, and, and I find it sort of interesting that you came from a financial sort of point of view and, and you're probably like a numbers guy and thinking about data and that your perspective about, you know, breaking it apart is, then in a, in um, very similar to when you're thinking about say brand strategy and you're thinking about like core um fundamental like it's uh, um I can't remember what the exact point before um, when you were talking but it was like oh it sounds like Chris is just talking about you know when you're formulating like a brand strategy <laughs> it's, it's the same <laughs> it, it, it's it's I was like oh that's like a really that sounds like eerily similar to, you know, the sort of conversations that we might have with people where you're talking about fundamental things, but it makes complete sense because it's like um, any great uh, tool that you're obviously using for some purpose, like a great presentation for some very important pitch, but then it's also effectively, you know, some sort of brand tool in a way, like a website might be like for, a different purpose, but it's still a tool that's got to have a purpose, right? Like you're trying to do something with it. So to get back to the roots of like who the audience is, all, all those fundamental things, it's like all, all the same things apply really, or, or many of them at least. Absolutely right. And it's interesting you mentioned about brand strategy. It's the deep thinking that takes place beforehand that makes things easy to consume. Yeah. And that's probably where we've lost our way of presentations because I think the overall standard isn't that low. We're not really forced to do it because we're kind of happy to accept average in that sense. We've seen a lot of average. We, you know, there's not a lot of great ones out there in that sense. And that's probably sort of that, that call to action to say, well, the, the 
the, the task as a presenter and the impact and change that you'd like to have, um, thinking in a way of doing the work for the audience you're talking to. And again, that's the idea of the audience is number one. How can I serve the people that I'm talking to? And one of the, th- the ideas is thinking this stuff out to a greater level of degree beforehand, making it easy to consume, making it to engage, making it more engaging. None of it's incredibly complex. It's just really those extra steps um, that you can take that will have an enormous impact. You can start doing that the next time that you present. You don't need to transform everything that you do. It's not about learning anything sort of complex, but it's really doing some of that work beforehand. Because we've been trapped in this idea of going, okay, I need to put a preso together. I'm going to put a couple of gender slides and start putting content out. And this idea of going information, information becomes talking to, it's kind of that's the status quo. That's the way most things are done. But what we've seen is a different way of doing it. And it's it's for those people who would like to do better to be improved. Not everyone wants to become a world-class speaker. Not everyone wants to become a TED talker in that sense. Some people do. People just want to be more effective and feel more confident in what they're doing and enjoy sort of in making an impact and, and feel like I did a good job and I made that change happen. Ultimately, I guess it just comes back to being a better communicator, right? You know, in, in, in just kind of going, you want to communicate. If you're breaking it down, like I'm like we were talking about before it, into what's its, what's its purpose. Therefore, if you if its purpose is X and you want to communicate that well, well then yep. it follows that you want to be a better you want to be better and more authentic and be, and for that to come across in this particular way. So how do you reverse engineer that to um, to do that? And that sort of absolutely and and that's kind of something that you know I mean it's 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 an interesting point that I often you know in sort of our world, I'm sure like a lot of different industries, people do this in different sort of ways, but I often have to straddle like creative thinking with analytical thinking and go, okay, great idea. And you want to go down the rabbit hole because that's got its own benefits to mm. a certain extent because you can sometimes come across you know, unexpected great ideas by doing that. But if you go too far, then you've got to like pull it back and there's this constant to and fro, which I always find like really interesting. And that's, and that's, um, um, you know, I guess part of that, the analytical part plus creative is where maybe storytelling, like, um, cause you talk about um, a little bit about storytelling too. Cause like, you know, as I'm sure like a lot of people relate to like story stories and storytelling is a great way to unify like a series of ideas into a cohesive, you know, method that keeps people's interests because they've got, you know, they've got the start, they've got to finish. And and like we were talking about before, you've got like an overview that you can go in and out and you can have little surprises on the way, right? You can go yep. in this part of the story and then people are like, oh, you know, and they sort of keep their interest up. So is that, so is, is so um when, how does, because the word storytelling, I think, can sometimes be confusing for people in this context where people go, it's like when people go brand storytelling, they go, oh, they, I mean, people kind of intuitively go, it's a story. And, but like, what is it, what does that actually mean in, say, a presentation? If you can give, like, even if you had like one example of a, a presentation, how does that actually manifest itself because i find <laughs> it's like one of those terms that's very amorphous like people go oh, brand storytelling yeah. or storytelling well, like yeah, what does it actually mean like in in like how you implement it like as as an example have you got something you can kind of i guess share so they can go oh yeah right it it means that yeah, that's, that's a great observation. I, I think most people feel the same thing when we hear storytelling in, in general in, in business or training and workshops or things. It, it doesn't always sit comfortably. Yeah, and yeah, so what is it? Like it sounds, yeah, I kind of get it, but how how do you implement it? Yeah, it's a great idea. Make the story. How do you, you know, it's not like one day I was, you know, um, I was working in the bakery and the next thing I was a CEO. And this and this is my journey. I mean, it's not it's not really that, but that's what people relate to as a story. So you're trying to pitch something. So say somebody's trying to, they go, okay, Chris, we want you to help us with like this great presentation, 
and it's like super important and this is going to change our lives and you know and then you and you go okay well it's it's a terrific way to to weave it into um this method of storytelling how how does that manifest itself I think the first thing to think of is that storytelling isn't always once upon a time. You know, there are different types of stories. Yes. Um, there's the easiest one to understand is case studies. So if you have some sort of product or service and you think it provides a benefit from someone, prove it by telling a case study, you know, rather than just relying on the sheer numbers. So we think about what stories do. Stories give a structure for information. They wrap some emotion around it and they make it interesting and easier to remember. So it's something for us to kind of connect to. Uh, financial services is terrible about doing this. So the idea of superannuation funds and fund managers, yes, there are numbers, but we're going to relate to that more about, well, we can do two things. If you'd like to prove that you can provide a superior outcome over time, prove it and, and show where that's worked before. Like pick someone. You don't have to give their client information, but give a case study of someone that brings that to life. Show the situation uh, what was the intervention, what was the interaction they took place and what took place then over time? What was the, the outcome from following that? So we think about, again, lots of different types of stories. Case studies are, are, are great ones. Um, we think about origin stories. Most times, you know, where did something come from? Where did a business or an idea start from? Why are you where you are today? What was the journey along the way that gives a context to where you are now? Mm-hmm. So an origin story is fantastic because, again, like what we shared this morning and for yourself, we didn't all just appear on day one and follow a linear path. Things follow a nonlinear path to get here, and they're really interesting, and they help give a context to what we're talking to. So case studies, origin stories. Um, to give a specific example, this is a, a couple of years ago working in Prezi. There was an agency that was pitching to create, um, uh, to be the communications agency for a member association. So what they're looking to do is to say, okay, here's the different ways of we can create content for your, uh, for your members. So there was a, a podcast. There was going to be uh, an, a daily email update. There was going to be a journal that would come out monthly. There'd be sort of other more frequent publications as well. Mm. It would have been really easy to present that as information and go, okay, so we will create this. This will have this readership and this is what it looks like. And that's probably the traditional way that we would approach it. Yeah. One of the best ways to tell a story is a day in the life. So instead of the traditional way, we created a present around a day in the life of what a member would look like. So they would wake up in the morning, they would have an email alert about some industry information that came out from there. They'd listen to podcasts on the way to work. They might go to a networking function at lunchtime, in the evening at the gym. They might sort of, you know, connect into a, a member network uh, sort of directory. Uh, and on the evening, they might be able to respond to a uh, an interview request. So the idea of going, okay, so rather than just presenting it, tell how someone interacts with that over a day in the life of. And we've used that one sort of quite a bit over time, that story type structure. It is a story, but what it's really doing is bringing to life the interaction that takes place for some way. So, for example, if you uh, imagine for your clients as well, too, like it's the idea of when they create something, what's a day in the life of how they might use that? You know, when will people see that at different times and how they interact and tell that story from one person? Yeah, no, that that's that explains that really well. And And I guess that's you know, probably I'd imagine a lot of people listening, they'll be like, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, that's I like, just, you know, it's 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 a, you know, but it's it's like a lot of different things, isn't it? It's it's like people, once they hear things or they see things, they're like, oh, yes. It, it's like the reaction often that I, well, I, I actually not often, almost all the time, is every single time um, I say to people, oh, have you considered a infographic? People go, what's an infographic? And then I yep. show them and they go, oh, yes, of course. Yeah, because everyone knows, oh, yes, I, I've, I've seen them like a million times. They're fantastic. You know, it's, it's, it's a, but it's, and then explaining, you know, people kind of intuitively know a bunch mm-hmm. of stuff. It's like people intuitively know, um, stock imagery when they see it these days is they'll, they'll go, oh, yeah, right. You know, people, and there it was like, how, how did you know that? You know, you don't look at stock imagery all the time like I do. No, but how, how did they know that then? Yeah. It's because they've, they've, they're obviously exposed to a lot of stuff. They're exposed like people are, people are probably my, my theory anyway is that people are like far more attuned to brands and imagery probably like ever than in, in, in the history of humankind because we're so, um, you know, subconsciously and consciously e- exposed to it all the time. 
So without realizing you're becoming more of an expert in it, you you are like you're just going, you're kind of making assessments about things without realizing. It's like when people, you know, they how 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 did somebody know that was a great presentation? They haven't seen like a thousand presentations like you have, Chris, but they saw this presentation and they were like, that that was incredible. How did they know that? It's because they felt it. And it was like the combination of like all these parts. They didn't, they didn't have to have the same experience as you to know that it was a great presentation because they felt it. Right. So, so then it's sort of, but then all the underlying things under that, that come to that end result, you know, people mm. will never know because the, the thought and all the things you're talking about, like, and, and then some people are just like, you know, naturally a bit more charismatic and people are like oh they're really drawn to them and they're um you know but all the all those moving parts that come together to make like the the final um story you know it's like a great a great book that's got like uh the cover on it isn't great we've got like a great cover on a book and you go wow i really want to read that you don't know what it's about but like you're drawn into it and then yep. get in and the book's great or the book's not great it's really boring and or, or it's like way better than you thought like there's you balance right yeah yeah it's 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 like all these things and then i guess kind of the magic happens when there's that good balance of those different things coming together um so you what what should should happen i mean uh I was reading this on on your site or in the in the playbook. I think is that what's the most important thing to happen in the first sixty seconds when someone's doing a presentation, Chris? Like, what should that? What's the most important thing to? Um, what should happen in those first sixty seconds when they start? If we think about that that audience perspective, so what's to take place in that first? You know, what what, what would you like to, for your audience to, take, to 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 occur for your audience in that first sixty seconds? First is some level of, you know, a level of engagement. You, you've captured their attention. So the idea is that you've got that. We, we keep saying you've got seven seconds to make an, a judgment. It, it kind of happens in a couple of phases. One is that we've got three things that, that where people make a judgment. There's that instant reaction going, do I know or like you? Have I seen you from somewhere else? Then you've got the kind of the seven seconds ish where you've got an, you create an impression. But the more informed judgment takes place in that first 60 seconds when you've got those two things together and you've had a bit of a chance to think about it. Mm. So what you're looking to be able to do is, is capture people's attention. Start with something that, that makes them pay attention. Um, outline the benefit that, that's going to take place for them and kind of a bit of an outline how you're going to get there. Mm. So imagine like a snapshot, this idea of going, I know what's going to take place and am I in or am I out? That's really the answer that you're trying to capture in that first 60 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that also makes a lot of sense too because you're either going to, um, you know, people are going to, Maybe they've already, um, like online or in the real world, they've already, uh, they've, they've already decided that they're going to tune out or they're like, you know, or, or they're just really tired. You know, there's like a lot of, um, factors, aren't there? Like for, you know, someone sitting in a room, maybe in a long day, maybe been, you know, they've like had a really hard night the night before they drank too much or they, you know, <laughs> there's all sorts well, of different things. There's all, there's like, and, and then you're there doing like, your bit to, you know, this with like these great visuals that complement what you're saying yep. and the messaging. Like it's, it's a really, I, I find it and I, um, I know I said this before, but I find it really um, fascinating that you came from the background that you came from, but it makes a lot of sense to me as we've been talking that because of, you know, there's, there's a certain analysis of breaking apart of, the different elements that you've thought about through your own sort of uh, traumatic experience, <laughs> you know, which, which is the great, like it's, it's a great starting point though, isn't it? If you're going, oh, you know, I really got to make that better. I mean, that's, that's like, that's like, like in sport too, right? Like you play sport and you go like, I'd be better at that. Or then you just give up and you don't do it anymore, you know, or you, you keep on going and you then go like, okay, well, analyze that. How can I make this bit better? Well, this bit and then you've gone like coming from your area into um what i would have 
previously gone, oh, that seems like incongruous that you know, someone like Chris would have done that. But as we've been talking, it's like, actually, it makes a lot of sense because of probably like how, you know, of my understanding of like how you probably think about things. So, um, so it actually makes a lot of sense now, like an hour or so into the podcast. I'm like, yeah, actually, that's fits. <laughs> that's kind of makes more sense to me than it did that. Um, I'm sort of at the start, but, um, I'll throw something at you too. And hopefully you remember this part about what you wrote. Tell us about the Greeks. The Greeks. Tell us, tell us about. The Greeks, people are probably going, what the hell is he talking about? But you can tell us. You can tell us what I'm talking about, Chris. Absolutely. Well, I think there was a book a a couple of years out called Naked Presenting. And if we think about sort of naked presenting, you know, back in sort of – Back in sort of the, the the days of sort of the Greek court, there wasn't any PowerPoint. Their job was to persuade people, and that was through use of rhetoric. So the idea of if you've got a group of people together and, you know, you're in the Senate or you've got a committee together, you know, what were they using? So what stood the test of time in being able to kind of create some change, the way change will people, you know, the way that people change, they thought about something or the action they took. We, we touched on before this idea about balance, like why are things working? Because there's, you know, what is the magic thing that makes work? And I think it's a balance, right? So we think about sort of that the Greeks had within rhetoric three things like egos, logos, and pathos. The idea idea is we can incorporate some of the thinking from that into our presentations and go, well, it's not just being one thing. It's a balance of things to be effective and make an impact. So we think about when you're presenting. First off is ethos is credibility. Like if people don't know you and most people don't or don't know you very well uh, to the extent, you've got to establish some reason and credibility to make people think that it's worthwhile listening to you. So this doesn't have to be, it's not about ego, but it's just really showing people that you've got some credibility to talk to what you're doing. You know, for yourself, it's the years of experience of your business and the clients that you work with. Like it's pretty easy to establish that credibility, you know, on your website, you've got some amazing work. So you've got that sort of credibility and it's making sure people understand that. The next thing is this idea around sort of pathos, which is emotion. You know, there needs to be, we need to feel something if we're going to make some sort of change in, in how we think or do mm. something in the difference. And that's what most of the time we're reading off a slide at 42 with 15 bullet points. We feel nothing, right? Slide 11 in, we're numb. But we kind of accept it in that way. And so I you know, come back to this idea of modulation. Let's change the energy up a little bit sometimes. Let's modulate what we're doing. Let's people feel things. And that's where stories are so important. Our whole presentation doesn't have to be a story, but we need to give people a reason to feel something. And that's making something relatable or interesting or unexpected or curious. There was this, one of the, the great story structures that we used sort of that I mentioned before is around sort of, you know, the sliding door story. So if you're trying to change something in the future, let's just give two different scenarios, competing scenarios. Here's what's going to take place if nothing changes and paint that scenario and contrast it with scenario B where the change that you're looking to take place has taken place and what the positive outcomes from that. It's a really kind of a clever story structure, but it makes people feel things by giving contrast. You're not just giving people information, Mm. you know, context about kind of what you're saying. And the other day is logos is logic. Like we we can't say crazy things. Like it needs to just, it needs to have some logic to what you're saying as well. You know, when you mentioned about sort of infographics, if we use that as an example before as well, like the idea of it's really easy to explain it. We think back to the kind of the Greeks and around sort of, you know, rhetoric, the idea of, you know, uh, credibility, like, okay, so, you know, you know, infographics are used by, you know, almost all major companies as one of the communication tools. They do it because it's effective. And these are some of the companies that have won campaigns and awards for beautiful infographics. The idea about the logic of that is going, well, it's a quicker way to be able to process information visually. You know, the cost versus the attention rate that it gets in communications and click throughs is this compared to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, the pathos, you know, the idea is they look amazing. Like, you know, have a look and see what you think. We feel it. You mentioned that before as people look, oh, I know those. And they have a, a, a familiar memory of seeing something previously when they look at that. So that's that mixture of those three things that come together. And mm. it works not just for presentations, but just the things in general, establishing, making sure you've got all of those. You get two of them right and you fall down on the third, you're going to limit the impact that you've got. But just it's a simple triangle to keep in place for anything that we do for presentations or thinking or explaining or persuading. Pretty simple. The Greeks said it a while ago, they've passed it down and it's not too hard for us to incorporate. Yeah, yeah. And people have, uh, well, for the most part, um, forgotten that because that used to be like a core part of of uh, education for those people who were educated, which certainly wasn't everybody, but that was was the standard sort of things. 
that were taught, you know, as, as, and it's, it's interesting that we're talking about it now because they, they were considered then to be foundational things for people to be good people and not just mm. good communicators, but at the foundation of societies to, to be not only to be able to convince people to do stuff or to convince people to, you know, about an idea, but also like the bigger picture was to be like sort of eloquent enough and um, articulate and sort of smart enough to be able to hold your own in a debate with another person and not, and it not be an argument and it be, you know, as a foundational part of like, um, because my sort of, the sort of the deeper level of that is that it was considered also that that was an important part to build like you know, a good society um, was to then have people, you know, who were say, you know, um, leaders in the society to actually run things in a balanced intellectual way where you could have, you know, ideally, I mean, obviously it didn't always work out like this. People would then just go, oh, well, I actually just want to fight you. Instead, you know, <laughs> a few times it ended up in that scenario. Yeah, yeah, a few times in the past, that's that's happened to be like that, and they didn't actually sit around and have you know that ideal you know level of rhetoric and debating. But when things came to a head, then they just fought each other. But the idea is there, and and it's still it's mm. still a good, even if it doesn't always obviously work out, it's still a good idea. And it's interesting that you know that's like um you know that level of thinking I find because when I was reading that I didn't actually read through all the meaning when I was going the Greeks I read through the first part and I was like ah I'm gonna bring that up with Chris because that sounds like a really foundational thing that like in my mind informed a bunch of other stuff that we've been talking about is 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 that true like is is that like you had or 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 did that come um, where, at, at what point during the process of thinking about hey, everything we've been talking about, did you then stumble across the, that idea later on and go, oh, yeah, that fits into what I'm talking about? Or or did that come first, like, uh, the chicken and the egg thing? Good question. I think it's embedded in everything that we kind of do or, you know, in the thinking beforehand. And it was just going back to revisit, going, yeah, that's actually – sort of where the framework comes from. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's there. And then that's a way sort of, of um, that's where it's uh, identifying that that's where the source has been over time. And coming back to the idea of like the Greeks, why we like that stuff, it's interesting. And that's, you know, when we mentioned sort of before about sort of frameworks and sort of ways to people to follow, this is communication. Presenting is probably the tip in that sense, you know, of Mm. that high level uh, of a challenge of communication. But once you get that part, if you can just take that part and work on that, everything else underneath that becomes easier. We're living in a world with a lot of short form communication. We've got this kind of disconnect between sort of people in that sense. And the overall standard of presentation isn't that great. Attacking that one in sense, uh, itself is going to be the, the challenge that will provide the benefit, not just when you present, but it will flow down in the other corporate communication or other communication that you do as well. It's your, it's the, uh, your own origin story in a way like a, or a part of of that sort of origin story is then talking about things like the greeks and like you know things that have informed then your thinking about you then like helping other people with this too and um um so with that in mind chris like we've we've actually like covered, we've covered like a fair bit of stuff have you got have you got any other um, specific sort of things about this particular topic that you'd really that I um, feel we haven't quite covered that you'd like to um, to, to share, like to slot in at this point? Thanks. We, we've covered quite a lot. I, I think probably it is the challenge, the mission out there, and, and just to encourage and empower people to do that. We, you know, from what we've seen over the over the last ten years of people who felt they were nervous, felt they weren't great presenters, but had that ability in them to do a, an amazing job. Um, that's the, encouraging people to try and, and sort of set the goal of where they can improve and, and, and aspire to become that. 
You know, it's one of those things that people, I think, shy away from thinking it's going to be too hard for me. Yeah, and definitely. this is the idea, of, you know, in, in purpose around it would be very simple to say, look, you don't need to transform everything. You, you've got, you've got some strengths going into this and to be able to share sort of five simple principles, follow those as the foundational footstep and relate them to what you do and just use maybe one of them next time in, in that sense. Focus on one thing and just start that process of improving. Um, because it will happen quicker and that feeling of walking away from a presentation, feeling that you've done an amazing job and you feel happy with yourself, happy with the outcome. It's pretty good. It's hard work sometimes to get there, but for something that can create so much tension and nerves and anxiety for someone to be able to conquer that and start to feel like you're doing good at it because we've seen it happen. You know, we've seen it happen for people who felt they weren't going to be great that put some of the little bit of the work in and that unlocks something then. And then it, it changed how they present. It changed their career. It changed the way they communicated. It unlocks all these beautiful benefits around it from there. And, you know, if you do present as part of your role, you've got this wonderful opportunity. You may have something in the diary coming up. Pick that one. Look at the five principles and think, what am I going to focus on for this one? And test and measure and learn from that one as well. But just start that path of working on because if we, if the hurdle isn't particularly high, if the standard isn't that great, you don't need to be Tony Robbins to become a, a, a world-class speaker. You can start making improvements and stand out very, very quickly against the average that's out there. Yeah, 100%. I think that's a fantastic um, sort of like en- ending Point for the podcast too, because I think that's that is, you know, outside of it being very true, and it's like it, it, it it's it's a huge confidence boost. I mean, I'm I'm no expert, but you know, it's just when you do things a lot and you work at it slowly, and then seeing like other friends and other people presenting who've been you know really really shy or they haven't felt they've been great, and just mm. it, just through the simple act of doing things often, and then just other people offering advice, you know, and then, you know, if, if, if then they have the opportunity um, to work with someone, I um, mean, you know, like yourself, like to add this like other level to it and work through that. I mean, it's, it's, it is really great. Those sorts of things are fantastic for, for you as a person, I think, like just, you know, outside of just being, it's, I think it's really true. Like it's, it's like any, uh, any sort of activity, uh, like especially things we've got to get, up in front of other people like it's it's just a it's a big deal for people you know even even when you're like better at it it's it's a it's it's tough and i yeah i think it's great i um, mean yeah, what you're doing and very interesting and so um um could you uh let us know i mentioned at the start i said that i would ask you to let everyone know about a a quote i always do this at the end of every every podcast if you've got like a from yourself, someone else, let us know. What is it, Chris? I've got something very simple, and that's probably sort of a great place to land for today. Hmm. The, the idea when it comes to presenting, we feel like we have to be someone else. We have to kind of follow something else. That's where that uncomfortable, that disconnect starts from. Very simple three words. Uh, what I'd like to share is just be authentically you. That's it. Yes. When it comes to this, hmm. be authentically you. That's a great starting point. And then yeah. you know, all the good stuff will follow from there. Very true. I think that's great and 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 very simple. I like simple. Simple's good, probably because um it's um simple. <laughs> I I guess that's that's the easiest way. No more to say on the point. It's just simple. But um so how do people find out more about you? And um I believe you've got something else then also to share with everyone too about the um the playbook. Absolutely. So uh, our website is presentationdesign.co, C-O. And, and what I like to do, as you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate in sharing this, the idea of people are looking to make that path. If someone's listening to this and thinking, that's me, I'd like to be able to start that path and journey, I'd love to share the book with them. So I've set aside 10 signed copies for your listeners from the, the podcast today. So I'd like to extend the invitation. So that's 10 free signed copies. Uh, we'll ship them to you. So if you are listening to the podcast and you'd like a copy of the book, which is called The Presentation Playbook, uh, Win the War for Tension and Make an Impact, um, my email address is chris, K-R-I-S, at presentationdesign.co. Drop me an email with your details uh, and we'll ship those out to you completely free of charge. That's our gift. If you've made that commitment from listening today, if you've, if you've listened to the podcast, if you've made that commitment, you think that's you, love to help on your way and send you a signed copy of the book. That's fantastic, Chris. And the best way to do it will be to say, uh, which I usually never say to people, go, 
make sure you stay listening until right at the end because Chris has got a <laughs> why do people do that? I always get really suspicious, but it's actually really true this time. Yeah, and people go, make sure you and then you reach the end and there's like nothing there. And you go, damn it, I was you know, I was scammed. But that's a great that's like a I've 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 had a look through it. It's really it's got a lot of like fantastic content. So I really encourage like everyone to um to take up that offer. I've got like, you know, a bunch of friends who I'm sure will jump at the chance. So um so I'm um but like thank you um so much. Chris, like for sharing all that information, it's really super interesting conversation about that like very specific topic and something that is um I know like a lot of people that I I know who do presentations a lot will be very interested to like they're always like hungry for um new things like to help them be better. So um so thanks again. And if you, any 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 parting words? Just to say thank you for your time. Thanks for the invitation. Um, the time's gone very quickly. Really enjoyed talking to you today, Saul. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for listening once again. And we'll see you again soon. Say goodbye to everyone, Chris. Bye, everyone. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Grow Your Business. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time here at the Grow Your Business podcast.